thanks to a lot to John who invited me here. I don't think I, I don't know who, where he is, but um, I'm very very grateful to be here. Uh, it's my first time at Scala World, and uh, it's already been great. Like the conference just started, there's already been so many great things. Uh, I've great made great memories, and yeah. So my talk is titled Monoids, 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 and I'm going to argue that monoids are kind of at the heart of almost everything in Scala. Um, and more generally, we're going to talk about things like abstract algebra and type theory, which might sound a bit academic and stuff, but uh, don't worry. I didn't learn any of this in university. I, I just, and that kind of discredits me. But I think these things are kind of simple, and we can, we can get to know them together and have a fun time. Um, okay. So my name is Luca Jakobowitz. And a little bit about me, I work at Comstock, and we're hiring. Um, if you're into purely functional Scala and want to revolutionize the commercial real estate uh, industry, uh, talk to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I maintain various type level libraries. Most of them um, have cats somewhere in the name. And uh, I'm very happy to do that. And if you want to help with that, also talk to me. And in general, I'm very enthusiastic about functional programming and these things in general. So without further ado, let's get going. Um, let's have a quick look at the agenda. So first, as the title suggests, we're going to talk about monoids. And then we're going to continue talking about monoids. And then um, after that, we have monoids, and lastly, monoids. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so we're going to talk about monoids, but we're also going to talk, as I said, about abstract algebra and type theory. And um, let's let's begin with a quick overview of monoids. Who here knows monoids? I can't really see you guys that well, but like, just raise your hand. Oh, that's a lot of you. OK, that's great. So I'm going to be quick about this. Um, Monoid is a type class, and it's defined by these two methods, empty and combine. Empty just returns an A um, that is parameterized over the monoid. And then combine just takes two A's and somehow combines them into a, into a single A. And a quick example for this would be the integer addition monoid, which um, as an empty just has 0. and the way to combine two things for with addition is to add them, obviously, right? Um, and this is one of the most basic monoids, but we can think of a lot of different things. And why they're useful is we can use them to combine a bunch of them together. Um, and so, for example, a list, which could be either empty or have a bunch of integers. Uh, in this case, and uh, we have this combined inf ins function, and we can use full left with these two operations we just saw in the monoid, um, zero and addition, to fold this list of integers into a single integer. We can do the same thing for strings. right? We have this combined strings function, which takes a list of strings and uses the empty string as its empty method, and then concatenates them uh, using this plus function, which is you know Java cruft. Uh, we can do the same thing for something like sets, where we have the empty set as the uh, as the identity element, or um, as the seed of this fold. And then we use the set union. Um, and more generally, we can generalize all of these functions and a bunch more into this combine all function um, that basically says, oh, OK, we can combine any list of t as long as this t has a monoid. And we will do so by using this monoid t.empty um, and this combine function, right? And so, as we saw earlier, the um, integer addition monoid did exactly this, and we can sort of generalize all of this, all of these combined ands, combined strings, combined sets um, into this combine all function. Uh, so this is really useful, and um, we'll see why because there are a lot of monoids around. So, um, for example, a function is or can be a monoid whenever the return type is a monoid, right? We can see that from the signature here. Um, we can do the same thing for option, where if the element um, type of that option, the A, is a monoid, then that, um, that option is also going to be a monoid. We can do the same thing for tuples. If both sides are monoids, 
and maps if the uh, value type is a monoid. This will just merge uh, two maps, and whenever a collision occurs, it will use that monoid to, um, to basically um, combine the two values where a conflict appears. Uh, we can also do something like this, where we have a monoid for IO of A, if A has a monoid, and this will just run two IOs um, after each other, and then we'll combine the results. You can do the same thing for future and other kinds of things. So there's many, many more of these. Um, I just listed some that are like, generally really useful, and most of them are in the standard library except for the last one. But I could sub this out for future and, you know. Anyways, um, so what can we do with these apart from, you know, the simple examples of folding a, lift, a list? Um, the cool thing about monoids is that, like, for example, in tuples, they are composable. So if we want to do something like a word count, say we have a list of words uh, from some text file, and what we could do then is use this step function and map it to a specific monoid. And this one will map any word, which is just a string, uh, to one, that word's length, and a map from that specific word to one. And if this monoid, what it will basically do is, uh, if, um, if we call this for every word that we have in our list, it will return, which we'll see here, the uh, total number of words, the total number of characters, and the occurrence of each word. Right? So this occurrences uh, value will basically be a map from each word that occurred to um, the amount of times it's occurred. And this is two lines of code. And it's really powerful. And we can extend this by just adding another uh, element to this tuple, which also would be a monoid. We could, for example, do something like give me the, the largest word uh, the max, you know, um, or the shortest word, or I don't know. There's lots of different things we can do here. And one thing, you know, this data is probably like an uh, a bounded type, like a list in memory. But you can also imagine it could be like, um, like an FS2 stream or a Monix observable. And we could do use something like ScanMap, which is available in both of these libraries. And basically, um, so if you're not familiar with Scan, basically what it does is it will give you a new stream, right? So this result is a new stream. And that will emit um, an intermediate result uh, every time the original stream, called stream here very unoriginally, uh, emits an, uh, uh, an element. So we can use these monoids in a lot of different ways. We can use them to process things in memories. Um, we can use them to process streams. Um, they could be like unbounded streams. You can do a lot of different things. Um, and the cool thing about this is that the CATS ecosystem really, really supports this very well. So if you're using, as I said, if you're using FS2 or Monix, uh, these things are available and they're really nice. Um, so the immediate thing we need to talk about, and this is kind of where the abstract algebra comes in, are monoids laws, right? And so if you're not familiar with these kind of algebraic law thinking, um, just, just give me some time. I think you'll, you'll get to it very quickly. So the first law of the monoid laws is you don't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's associativity. Um, associativity is very, very uh, important in some ways. Um, and it also props up a lot. So associativity basically means that the order of doing things doesn't really matter. So x, so x combined with y, and this is just monoids combined. This is like syntax sugar for just the combined operation. Um, so x combined with y, and then combined with z or z, has to be the same thing as first combining y and z, and then using x combined with that. Um, this is asso associativity, and I think I don't know. I think I learned this in like sixth grade, and back then it was like, "What the hell is this?" But apparently, this is a really useful property. Um, so this is one law, and then the other law, or the other laws, um, is right identity, the identity law, which basically says that if you combine something with the empty, it's like a no-op. It doesn't do anything, right? So if you add zero to something, or you add the empty string to a string, it's going to be the same. It's not going to do anything. Or if you, you know. Um, take the union off the empty set, that's not going to do anything. And this goes for doing something to the right, but also doing it on the left, right? So if you have the empty on the left, this should remain the same. And that, that's, all, that's all the monoid laws really tell. Um, and why this is useful 
is something like this. So we can look at associativity in action. And we can imagine like a list of lots of things we want to aggregate. So I don't know. This is like, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. This is a very small amount of elements. But imagine these are 500,000 elements. And we all want to aggregate them together using some monoid. And what the associativity law gives us is basically we can say, oh, we can use these parentheses and we can just group them any way we want. So we could transform this um, just by using like mass substitution, but by using the associativity law and say, oh, okay, uh, these things are completely equivalent. And basically what this means is we can fully parallelize any associative operation, right? So we can calculate these individual groupings um, in parallel and at the end then um, apply the, um, the binary operation, the combined operator, to those intermediate results. And we will be, if we are law-abiding, right, if we abide by the associativity law, this will give us the exact same um, result as just doing it all in sequence. And uh, this gives us determinism, and that's, that's a really powerful thing. Um, so one way to do this with something like FS2, and if you don't know FS2, don't worry about it. Um, I'm just going to go over this really quickly. So we have a stream where A has to have some kind of monoid. And we define this max parallel, which basically just says how many things we want to do in parallel, which we're just going to set to the available processor cores. And what we then do is take a stream, chunk it, um, which is just going to return um, a string of like individual chunks. And then we're going to use this map async, which is going to uh, do a bunch of things in parallel and use this combine all that we saw earlier to basically um, fold down those chunks into a single A, which then again gives us a stream of A, what we had before, but these are now intermediate results. And then we use compile.fold monoid, which basically is just going to um, fold those into uh, intermediate values into a single value of A, which at the end will give us an IO of A. Um, and again, if you don't know FS2, that's fine. This is just to give you an idea. Um, so yeah, this is parallel aggregation. And this, is, this will only be deterministic if our monoid is associative. So that's why these laws can be important. So speaking about laws, there are a bunch of different kinds of laws. So what we saw was associativity and the identity laws. Um, but there's a bunch of other things. So this thing, there's this law called invertibility. There is commutativity, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. It's just A combined with B has to be the same as B combined with A. Um, there's also idempotency, which probably a lot of you are familiar with from, I don't know, like REST APIs and stuff. Um, but there's also absorption and distributivity. And so we're kind of like going to go through these and how they relate to like different algebraic structures. Um, and if we look at something like Katz kernel, you'll see this diagram. It's like, whew, OK, there is a bunch of arrows here. I've heard of monoids. And I guess, I don't know. So this is, this is confusing, I think. Like, um, but we'll try to, to try to make sense of this. And I think, like, I hope after this talk, you will look at this and be like, oh, OK, this is, this is not that hard. This is not hard. It has some weird names, like bounded semi-lattice and stuff. But we'll get to it. And this diagram, which is available on the CATS documentation, um, is basically the key to all of this. So basically, at the top, we have the specific laws that have to hold. and um, they all have to be associative, so all of these algebraic structures. And then we also have commutativity, identity laws, inverse or invertibility laws, and idempotency laws. And um, by, by using a combination of these, we get all of these different structures. So if you understand those five laws at the top, you can understand exactly what these structures on the left are. Right? And so the first thing we're going to look at is semigroup which is exactly like monoid, just it doesn't have a tick on identity. So it's just an associative binary operation. And um, it's a very simple thing. And it's, it's, it's nice because, for example, with monoids, you can fold lists. But with semigroups, you can fold non-empty lists. And yeah, so the next thing 
we're going to look at is these things called groups. And groups, so all groups are monoids, but not all monoids are groups. And groups extend monoids with this uh, simple um, inverse function. An inverse function takes an A and returns another A, and basically it maps every element to its inverse in, in that same set. Um, and the laws it has to abide by are basically that if you combine something with its own inverse, that is going to be the identity or the neutral or the empty element. Um, and the same goes if you flip it around. And so some examples for this taken from numbers are uh, for addition, this inverse function is just multiplying by minus 1 and getting, you know, the, the additive inverse. So 5 plus minus 5 is 0, which is the identity element for addition, right? So if you add 0, you get back the same number. And for multiplication, that um, inverse function is 1 divided by. So the inverse of 4 is 1 fourth, and that when multiplied together, we'll give you one, which is the multiplicative identity um, of that multiplicative group. And a really interesting group that you can find here is um, the symmetric difference group of sets, where the inverse function is kind of an identity function, right? And that basically means that if you take a set and um, use a symmetric difference with itself, it's going to return an empty set. And this is still a, a completely valid group. Um, it's just uh, an odd one. It's kind of to show you how uh, these things are only defined by their laws. And um, something like combine, like the word combine kind of says like, oh, OK, we're combining two things. But actually, like we're kind of, it's still, the only thing that matters is that the laws are kind of held. Um, and yeah. So these are. Um, some examples for groups, but we can also find other examples. So a Rubik's cube actually forms a, a group. Um, like so it's a special group called a permutation group, and it has about, I think, like 46 quintillion, don't quote me on that, uh, permutations. And it's really interesting. Uh, if you're interested in Rubik's cubes and how to solve them using uh, abstract algebra and group theory, you can look at Stuart Stewart's talk um, at uh, Northeast Scala. He gave a great talk on, that's like 45 minutes, only talking about group theory and um, Rubik's Cubes. So this is one application which is probably not that useful for most of you. But you can think of um, groups as something where whenever you have like an inverse. So for example, say you're doing some event sourcing um, and you know you have an append-only log, which kind of fits with the whole monoid moniker. You can add things, add things. Um, but sometimes you write, want to derive some state, and that state might say, oh, okay, I want to add a bunch of things, but I also want to remove them. But since you have an append-only log, you can't really do that that well um, without you know, modifying the log. Um, and this is kind of where groups come in, where you can say, oh, okay, I have like um, um, an add person event and also a remove person event. And these are, of course, inverses of each other, and they cancel each other out. And um, yeah, you can model things this way. And it gives you some nice algebraic properties that you can re reason with. Um, and you can generalize this sort of thing into something like a negative list. So uh, maybe some of you have heard like list is kind of like a free monoid. And this is kind of like a, a free group where you have like an add node and a remove node. And you can interpret this thing at the end into some kind of state where um, at the end, you will only have those add nodes that haven't been removed. Um, and I played with it for like an hour some months ago, and it was really fun. Um, I don't know if this is like production ready or whatever, but it's a neat idea. And this is kind of what um, this algebraic thinking can give you. You can, you can come up with these new ideas. And it's, sometimes it will end up really useful, sometimes not. But this is kind of the, the nature of playing around. And anyways, the next algebraic structure I want to look at is called semi-lattice. So this has a weird name. Um, it's not about salad. Um, but it is. it extends commutative semi-group, right? So it's not a monoid, but it is a semi-group. Um, and the only thing it adds, it doesn't add any extra functions. The only thing it adds 
is this requirement, and this is the item potency requirement. Uh, so A combined with A is still A. And this is again where kind of like the combine intuition kind of doesn't really work, where like you're combining two things, you're combining something with itself and it remains the same. But just try to go with the flow. I'm gonna give some examples. Um, so for example, Boolean forms two different semi-lattices where um, if you combine two Booleans uh, with and, right? So if you say true and true, that's still gonna be true. If you say false and false, that's still gonna be false. True or true is still true. False or false is still false, right? So these, this is kind of how uh, Booleans are idempotent, idempotent. And this applies to any Boolean algebra, not just the true and false one. Uh, but it also works for things like set union and set intersection where if you union something with itself, it's going to be the same, same with intersection. And it also works for something like taking the maximum and minimum of something, right? So if you have um, max of seven and seven, that's still going to be seven. Or if you take the minimum of two numbers, they're still, it's still gonna be the same, right? And again, this is kind of like where combine as a word doesn't really, like taking the maximum of two things is not really combining them, but also kind of, I guess, but uh, it's really about being an associative binary operation. And in this case, an associative commutative idempotent binary operation, right? This is, these are similar lattices, and they are really, really useful because I think for anyone that has done some concurrent or distributed programming, um, these things pop up a lot where you have some kind of idempotency requirement. So for example, you might have to consume messages with um, guaranteed at least once delivery, which means that, okay, you're gonna get um, a message once, but you might get it more than once, right? In order to bring determinism, determinism back into your system, you will have to use some form of idempotency. And simulatuses can help you model that. And the cool thing about all of these type classes um, is that they come with their associated laws. So it's like, uh, you can just write your code, add a semi-lattice instance for it, and then um, using something called Cat's Laws and Discipline, Discipline, which is a library, not actual discipline, <laughs> um, you can write like you can write very simple tests, which is just a one-liner. It says, check all the laws for the semi-lattice of my specific data type, and it will run uh, property-based tests. Um, and yeah. You will basically it will not prove that your um, that your that these laws hold, but it will give you a very very high degree of confidence that they should. They, and yeah, so another thing uh, where this comes in handy is you know something like CODTs where you have a distributed system, and you don't want to have like a large communication overhead to um, to have the same state on all of your nodes in like a cluster or something. Um, and this is where item potency really comes in handy because, um, yeah, you don't need to like send all these messages around to synchronize state over different, um, uh, over different servers. And yeah, basically anywhere you require item potency, you can model it as a semi-lattice and actually be sure that what you're doing is item potent by using property-based checks. Okay. So, so much for semi-lattices. So... Now we've kind of learned about associativity, commutativ commutativity, identity laws, invertibility, and idempotency. And I think we've, like, now I think these type classes on the left should make sense. We've talked about most of these. We have band here, which is just a semi group that is idempotent. So it's kind of like a semi lattice, but not commutative. And then we have commutative monoid, commutative group, which, you know, are just commutative monoids and commutative groups. <laughs> And we also have bounded semi-lattice, which is a monoid that is also commutative and idempotent, or it's just a semi-lattice, which also has a bound or an identity. Excuse me. Yeah. So, right. Any questions about these so far? No? Perfect. Perfect. Cool. So you learned, like, a, a ton of new type classes today, so I, I, I hope you're happy. Um, let's look at another different algebraic laws. So... We've talked about associativity, identity, and vulnerability, commutativity, and item potency, but these two, absorption and distributivity, uh, we haven't talked about yet. So, 
And for these, we kind of need to introduce like um, a different kind of algebraic structure. And the first we're going to look at are ring-like structures. And these have weird names, but that's mathematicians, I guess. Um, so we're going to look at a very simple one called semi-ring. And basically, it has a plus function, a times function, and a zero function. And um, this is kind of like different algebraic structures merged into one. So plus and zero actually form a commutative monoid, right? Uh, so zero is the identity of plus. And it's, you know, it's kind of like numbers where you know, if you add zero to something, that is the identity. Um, and then times forms a semigroup. These are the only requirements um, for these two. But now we have this absorption uh, property, which basically says that if you use times with this zero thing, then that will always have to be zero. So a times zero is still zero. Um, and it kind of like absorbs any value you put into it. Um, and then you also have distributivity. So times has to distribute over plus, which looks like this. And again, I mean, I learned this in like sixth grade and I had no idea what, why this was useful or why we're learning this. But like now, I don't know how many years later, this is, this is kind of cool. Um, yeah, again, so A times B plus C has to be A times B plus A times C. And you might think, oh, okay, so this is just like a numbers thing, but actually these things prop up a lot, um, and I'm going to show you later. But first we have to, uh, like, just like an overview. So I talked about this one, which is a commutative additive monoid uh, glued together with a multiplicative semigroup, which gives you the semi-ring. If we turn that additive monoid into a group, we get a rung, which has a really weird name. And if we um, instead turn that multiplicative semigroup into a multiplicative monoid, we get a rig. And now we finally get to our ring, which is a commutative additive group glued together with a multiplicative monoid. And the reason why these are called rung and rig is basically, so rung is like a rig without the i without the identity, right? So it's a multiplicative semigroup. It doesn't have the identity. So, and the reason it's called a rig is like a ring without the n, without negation, right? Because you can't negate that additive monoid. And yeah, mathematicians are, you know, <laughs> that's how they do things. Um, and if you have all of these properties, if you have a commutative additive group and a multiplicative group, you get a field. Um, and I guess now you kind of know these five new structures, but you don't have to memorize them, right? So if you only know the laws and you know how they interact with each other, you can derive or you can look like, oh, what is um, a commutative monoid with, a uh, with another monoid called? And then you can just look it up on, on oh, and I, I forgot to mention this, but all of these structures, these more complex structures where you have multiple algebraic structures merged into one, they were all in um, a project called Type Level Algebra. Or, and, um, they, and they can also be found in stuff like Type Level Spire or Twitter Algebra. Um, and yeah, these basically, um, I'm not sure where I was going with this. But yeah, you don't have to memorize all of these because they're well documented. And the only thing you know is like, oh, I have um, an additive group here. And I also have something that another operation that distributes over it, but it's also only a semigroup. Hmm, I don't know what it is. I don't. I always. I don't always know what it is. So I just look it up, and then I see. Oh, I guess this is a rung. Okay, that's cool. What can I do with this? Um, but before we look at that, we have to look at lattice-like structures. So if we have two semi-lattices that we talked about earlier on the same type, that gives us the lattice. And if now um, we add bounds to that, so we have like uh, identity elements for those two semi-lattices, we get a bounded lattice. If we have two semi-lattices that distribute over another, and that basically means that the operation of the one semi-lattice distributes over the other, but also the other way around, um, then we get a distributive lattice. And um, if we have two bounded semi-lattices that distribute over another, we get a bounded distributive lattice, right? So this is just adding words together that mean something. <laughs> um, and yeah, now you learned about lattices and rings, and I hope it wasn't like these things. I mean, it's just 
adding different algebraic laws together into different structures, and then you get different names. And that's, that's basically all it is. It's not super fancy mathematics. It's just having laws. And so it's more abstract. It's not like a very concrete thing. So, so far, we talked a lot about um, algebraic structures as type classes. So we talked about them at the value level. And now this is kind of where the type theory part comes in. Um, so we can kind of encounter these monoids or these different algebraic structures um, at the type level as well. And I'll show you what that means. So product types are kind of like monoids, just in a different way that we, that we expect. So if we look at product types as tuples, which they are, um, they're kind of like an operator between types. So if we have type A and we have type B, the, we can apply this product, right? This multiplication, which is a pro, you know, product. Um, and that gives us a new type. Just like if we multiply two values, we get a new value. If we multiply two types, we get a new type. So the multiplication of type A and B in Scala is tuple AB. And this is associative, right? So if you look at these two types, A tupled with BC and AB tupled with C, these kind of like, these have the same structure, right? You, so basically, when we're talking about equality right now, um, we're not saying like, oh, this is exactly the same. But um, you can like, as you can say here from this bidirectional arrow thing, you can go from one to the other without losing any information. And you can do that as many times as you want. Um, and so identity, uh, product types also have an identity, which is unit. And so you can kind of think of like, oh, OK, A tupled with unit is kind of the same as A, because unit has just one inhabitant. And you don't use any information if you just get rid of it. And you don't gain any information by just adding it, right? And um, basically, product types, um, if you think of the set of the inhabitants, right, which are all of the unique elements any type can have, um, then a product of two types is just a Cartesian product of the set of inhabitants of those types. And so if you look at this in like a Venn diagram, uh, we can see here that uh, type X has three inhabitants, A, B, C. Type Y has two inhabitants, A, uh, one, two. And if we take a tuple of these two types, a product, we get the Cartesian product, which is A1, A2. This is all of the um, unique inhabitants of X tuple Y. And the cool thing about this, kind of, is that if you look at the cardinality of x, which is 3, right? the cardinality just means how many unique members it has. And if we look at the cardinality of y, we have 3 and 2. And if we say, oh, OK, this is a product type, so we multiply things. right? So, And if we multiply 3 by 2, we get 6, which is the cardinality of tuple xy. And these are kind of things where like things start to, you know, OK, we have things, and we can multiply them. And that's kind of like a Cartesian product in the sets. But it's also like multiplication in the cardinalities of these types. Um, so yeah, this is how product types work in general. And this is how it forms a monoid, right? Uh, so if you form a, a tuple with unit, you get this new type x and unit. And um, as you can see here, basically, this these like x and x and unit are the same thing, right? You can see how you can easily go from one to another without losing or gaining anything. So yeah, product types are monoids. We can do the same thing for some types. Um, and sometimes can be like product and sometimes can be anything, right? They can be seal trait, they can be case classes. I'm just using tuples here to kind of show the point and um, they're the most basic uh, product and some type, either's and tuples. So you have associativity for either's, right? These things kind of are the same, where in both cases you have either an A, a B, or a C. Um, and we have an identity, and it's called nothing. And nothing is a type which has no inhabitants. So you can never have a value of nothing. And that basically means that if you have an either A or nothing, that means you can never put any type into the right-hand side. And actually, if you type um, just left, of A, that will give you exactly this, an either of A and nothing. And yeah, because there can't be any right-hand side, 
that means it is equivalent to just saying A, right? And if we look at this um, from the set theoretic way, this is kind of like the disjoint union of the two sets. So if you look at our fancy Venn diagrams, uh, we have, again, X and Y. And if we use either, we can say, oh, OK, all of the possible values here are left A, left B, left C, right 1, right 2. And again, because some types form sums, we can add their cardinalities together to get the cardinality of the resulting sum type, right? So 3 plus 2 is 5, which is the cardinality of either x, y. OK. And again, here we see that's a monoid simply by saying, OK, if we have nothing here, the only values we can get are the left values. We can't get any right values. So this is why it's a monoid. OK, so far so good. But how, how is this relevant? Um, but actually, this, this, this stuff comes up in, in CATS itself. So <coughs> if we look at something like semi groupal I'm not sure how many are familiar with this. But it is in CATS. And stuff like monad and applicative extends from it. So you've probably somehow used it, even if you're not aware of it. Um, it has this product function, which takes an f of a and an f of b and returns a t an f of tuple a b. And um, we could call this an abstract higher kinded semigroup um, that merges two contexts inside of a product type. Right? So we use this product, we borrow this product type structure, and we know that it's a monoid or a semigroup at least. Um, and we kind of use it to merge these two f contexts together, which could be you know anything, future, option, IO, whatever. And um, actually, the apply uh, type class in cats extends both semigroupal and functor. And this app function, uh, which you know is like applicatives defining function, um, is, uh, is basically equivalent to saying product and map. And I've kind of shown it here. But you can also go the other way around. You can get to product from app, or you can get from app to product. As long as you have this functor, it'll work out great. So apply is kind of like a higher kind of semigroup, and, um, right, or you can call it a semigroupal functor. And applicative is kind of like a monoidal functor. So we could have this monoidal thing where we use the product type identity, which is unit, um, as its own identity inside of this f context. And applicative is basically exactly that, except instead of this unit function, we use this pure function which you know, takes an A and lifts that into an F of A. But if you think about it, you can do that if you have map, right? if you have a functor. You can just say unit.map and then map that to whatever A you want. And so these pure and unit are, again, equivalent as long as you have um, the functor instance. So this is kind of like um, a monoidal functor and a semigroupal functor right? with um, with product types. Can we do the same thing for some types? Uh, and yeah, we can. And so we have this sum semigroupal, which you know defines sum instead of product. And instead of having a tuple, it just uses either. And uh, we can find a monoidal for this as well and say, OK, it's just going to be f of nothing. Um, so we merge two contexts inside of a sum type. And actually, this thing like it doesn't look familiar, but it already exists in cats. It just has a different name. So it's called semigroup k. And instead of using the sum function, it uses this combined k function, um, which instead of taking a, a and b, it just takes two a's here and then returns an f of a. And this works because um, if you think about it, if you call sum on x and y here, you get an f of either a or a, which you can then merge back to a single a where you know it doesn't matter which type it is. It's kind of like fold with identity on both sides. So this thing exists uh, in cats today, and probably some of you use it. And uh, we can extend this to monoid k, um, which you know, I guess, in some terms is uh, an additive monoidal functor. And instead of using nothing here, we just use universal quantification, which for covariant functors is the same, right? So empty. Uh, f a for all a f of a, you know, which basically says that okay, it doesn't matter which a. I'm not going to give you. There's not going to be an a in here because this could be every anything, right? Um, these are equivalent to just saying f of nothing. So, 
we learned about these different kind of type classes that are in cats, and uh, we can use them in different ways for iteration. So we know about fold map, which just takes an f of a, where f is like foldable or something, uh, a list, an option, a vector, whatever. And if we map an a to an m, we get an m when m is a monoid. But we can do the same thing for monoid k. We can do the same thing for applicative, which is, you know, just traverse, which is an amazing function that I gave like plenty of talks about. <laughs> and we can do the same thing for monads. So yeah, monads are kind of just monoids. And you know, there's this saying that monoids are just monoids in the category of endofunctors, even though, you know, that's just, why would anyone ever say that without explaining what it means? Um, but basically it all comes down to these same two type of laws where you have associativity and identity, right? So these are the monoid laws again. Uh, it's just left identity here, um, but it doesn't really matter. And the applicative laws can be formulated kind of in the same way, right? So it's just associativity and identity. Uh, the monarch K laws are kind of the same way. You have this nice like TIE fighter looking uh, thing. Um, and the monoid laws are actually exactly the same as well. So we're kind of, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. Um, just with like different formulations and different shapes. Um, but I'm gonna gloss over this a bit for time constraints. So the next cool thing is that some and product types like form this thing called a commutative rig. Um, I'm gonna show you what that means. So if we kind of like alias this to plus, multiply, zero and one, um, you know, we can see how um, the absorption and distributivity applies to it. So if we tuple something with nothing, that means we can never fully uh, fulfill this type. We can never have an instance of int and nothing, right? Because nothing doesn't have a type, so uh, not have any inhabitants. So this will always just be the same as nothing. And also, uh, either and tuples distribute over each other. I'm not going to show you this, but you have to trust me. Uh, you can verify it yourself, or you can just ask me. I'm I'm always available to talk here in the conference or on Gitter. So if you have any questions, um, please ping me or something. And of course, you know, either and tuple are commutative where you can go from either AB to either BA without losing anything or tuple AB to tuple BA, yeah. So it kind of forms a commutative rig and you can kind of see how this works where if you like try to form the Cartesian product of ABC and nothing, you'll just end up with nothing. Um, and a really cool thing is that alternative, you know, the type class, is just applicative with monoid k. And we learned that these are additive and multiplicative monoidal functors. And this basically gives you a higher kinded rig, so a higher, I guess you could call it a wriggle functor, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't make up these names, so. Uh, but basically it has the sum function, the product function, the pure and empty function that we talked about earlier, and it combines them all, and it has exactly the same laws as uh, a rig, which is, you know, absorption and distributivity. So this is neat. Um, what else is there? We can kind of start talking about SCA3 and Dottie because they have some really neat new uh, type theoretic construct. And one of those are union types and they form bounded semilattices. So again, we have associativity, right? So uh, A union with B union with C is the same as A union B, you get it. Um, and the identity for this is nothing because you know, it's kind of like saying it's one type or another. Um, and if you have one type or nothing, it's just gonna be A. And these are commutative, which is nice. And they're also idempotent, right? So A or A, it's just going to be A. Um, and yeah, this is akin to the union of the sets of those two types. Um, and the cool thing is that like, if you notice this, we use this equal colon equals instead of this bidirectional arrow thing, because unlike uh, the, the equivalence relation we talked about earlier, which, you know, we could call isomorphism, if you want, we have to say, oh, okay, this, is, this has the same structure, but we need to map to and from it. These are actually considered equal types, right? So um, something like the, all of these laws, you don't even need to like try to prove them because the Dottie compiler proves this for you. So if you write a function that expects an A or B, you can give it a value of B or A because Dottie considers them the same thing. 
So this is nice. Um, and you might wonder about the difference between sum and union types. And the only difference is if you have two types that are non-disjoint. So if you look at um, these two sets here, x and y, we have abc and ab. In the union case, we just get x back, right? But in the sum type case, we get uh, we kind of duplicate a and b here because we can differentiate between the left hand side and the right hand side, right? And this is kind of the difference between sum and union types. Mm. And yeah, so union types are bounded semi lattices, right? So if we um, form the union with nothing, we get back the same thing. Um, intersection types are also bounded semi lattices, so they have associativity. They have identity with any this time. And again, Dottie will prove all of this. And commutativity, which is really nice. Like um, in Scala 2, we had with, which is kind of like this intersection, but a bit different. Um, and the problem was that it's not commutative, but this um, and, this intersection, is not commutative. Um, so it's nice. And of course, it's also idempotent, idempotent, whatever. Um, and yeah, of course, this is basically equivalent to the intersection of these two types. Um, so if you look at how this looks in Venn diagrams, ABC intersected with ABD is just going to be AB. And if we intersect something with any, which has every single, like every single element is contained in this any type, right? So if we intersect with that, we're just going to get X again, right? That just makes sense. Okay, cool. And now this crazy thing, union intersection types together form a bounded distributive lattice, which you know is just basically two semi, two bounded semi lattices glued together that distribute over each other and uh, absorb each other, right? So um, we have idempotency, as we showed earlier. We have absorption, which basically says that if I take the union of any type with any, well not any type, a with any, we get any, and if we uh, form the intersection of A with nothing, we get nothing, right? So nothing absorbs intersections and any absorbs unions. And then we also have distributivity. And this, again, is something you can just let the compiler check for you. I don't have to prove it to you because the compiler does all of this for me. So union distributes over intersection, intersection distributes over union. Whew, that was a lot of talking. Um, more Venn diagrams. <laughs> so yeah, this is basically absorption using any. Um, this is absorption using nothing, right, and intersection types. And how the hell is this useful? So as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of trying to get like an intuition to start thinking about things algebraically. And what we could play around with is something like this, like maybe CATS 4.0 or CATS 5.0 will may be able to have these kind of features where we have like a union monoidal, where we say, oh, okay, I have an F of A and an F of B, and I'm going to return an f of union ab. And then, of course, we also have the identity empty. And the cool thing about this is like we can derive something like combine k out of it simply by saying, so combine k is kind of like a specialization. Because if you think about it, if x and y um, are f of a and f of a, if we take the union of a and a, uh, Dottie considers that to do just a. right? So this is an f of a. And we could also derive some from it by just mapping them to left and right. So I tested this yesterday, and it worked. And I was like, OK, this is neat. I'm going to put it into my talk. <laughs> so yeah, learning about these things kind of like leads you to experiment with new designs. So you could also um, figure out something like this, where either where one side is unit is kind of like equivalent to an option, right? Because option has this none case which just has a single inhabitant, and that's the same as unit. So either unit of A is the same as option of A, either nothing or A is the same as A, um, and A and unit is the same as A. And what, what does this give us? We can think about like how these concepts are also encoded as type classes, like MTL type classes, like applicative error. So applicative error with unit is just like alternative. Um, Monad error with nothing is just monad because you can't have any errors. And monad writer with unit is just monad. And if you don't know what any of these means, um, don't worry about it. It's just some examples I came up with. Um, and if you want to learn about this, please talk to me. I'll, I'll be very happy to share more. Um, 
Another thing we could do is say, like, just how option has this none case, which is a unit type. We can do the same thing for list, which has the nil case, which is just unit. And we can generalize this to say, oh, okay, instead of taking unit, we can just like parameterize it and say, okay, this has a different type parameter B. And so instead of head being like A or unit, like an option of unit, an option of A, we could say head is now a union of A and B. So it's either A or B. Um, so and if you know the nil case kind of looks like this now. And what this gives us is something like this, where you can say list is um, a G list, a generalized list of A and unit, right? So in this case, we would get head would be A or unit, which is you know similar to option. And in a non-empty list, we would get A or nothing, which you know um, because it's um, the same as A, and the compiler treats it the same as A. We now have a head function that you know uh, just gives us back an A, and this is completely polymorphic, and we can kind of like do these really neat stuff because we know about how the algebra works and what erases to what. Okay, I'm almost done. Other cool stuff. Uh, monad error is actually like two monads glued together, like based on either. Um, so it's kind of like um, kind of like a semi ring or kind of like a rig or whatever. Um, it was a bit more complicated that I'd be happy to share more in private. Um, parallel is really cool. You know, the parallel type class, it has, it's kind of like two monoids with the same identity. So zero equals one here. You know, you have like an applicative and a monad and they both have pure and um, they're the same thing. So this is apparently called like a duoid or united monoid. I'm not super sure about this, but I've read like a, some bark parts about this and it's not very common, but it's a very interesting property. Um, and yeah. Categories are monoids too, where composition of categories is uh, the associative operation and the huh, category identity, the error ID is the identity of that monoid. Um, this is really cool. Cat's retry retry policy is actually a banded distributive lattice. Who do? And um, there's a really cool talk by I forgot his name, but he basically talks about animations in Swift that form uh, a rig as well, where you kind of like compose them and sequence in parallel, and that distributes over each other, and it's, it's really nice. So to conclude, uh, we learned a lot. Today, I hope, I hope, <laughs> um, we have all of these different algebraic structures that you don't have to memorize, but you can like classify them as lattices, as rings, as groups. Um, and we can use these concepts, and we already use these concepts in libraries like CATS, um, and we can use them in higher kind of versions, and those give us some really unique properties like applicatives um, and semigroup K, monoid K. Uh, we also learned a lot, I hope, about Scala's type system and how it's based on these algebraic laws and how, you know, um, we have these things called algebraic data types and they're called algebraic for a reason. And when I first learned Scala, I heard algebraic data types. I was like, okay, what's algebraic about them? And then I realized like, oh shit, okay, there's actually some real cool theory about this. Yeah, and then we also looked at some of the changes made to the type system in Dottie and how they take this concept of algebra in the types even further. So I hope that made a lot of sense. I think I'm out of time, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, if, there, if we have time, do we have time quick questions? Probably not, no, that's all good. Okay, thank you very much for listening. We're hiring at Comstack, um, so yeah, hit me up on that. And thank you for listening. You can find me on Twitter by this handle, or on GitHub, or on Gitter, or just talk to me on the conference, I'll be here. Thank you so much.